الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our Friday حلقة uh, which we have uh, الحمد لله in which we have come back to our original series which is about a thematic commentary on the Quran and uh, basically what we do what we do in this series is that we treat the Quran at the thematic level so we look at the subject matter of each surah we try to identify in every surah the central and the main theme the overarching theme that sort of runs through the whole surah uh, we try to detect it and we try to see the verse that uh, represents it the most or the most accurately and then we go over the surah trying to connect all of the sub themes to this main theme hopefully this will uh, bring or make visible to us the uh, thematic unity and consistency in the quran and will also help us as well look at the surah as one as as one unit as one unified uh, sort of structure and this is very powerful in our it's a very powerful element in our understanding of the quran and the way we relate to it uh, so we uh, last time I think we covered up until uh, in Surah An-Nisa we were dealing with Surah An-Nisa we covered um, the verses up until verse number 57 so we're going to start from verse number 58 and uh, let me take an overview over about the next five pages that we are going to deal with today in, uh, in these five pages Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, establishes some principles and I find it I find it actually befitting here to um, bring back to your attention uh, the central theme that we believe runs through Surah An-Nisa and we said it is about the the family unit the unity of humans that they are all the same they come from the same father and mother and that they are brothers to one another so there's blood relationship among all humans and this theme is connected to the the theme of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since we we're all the same and we came from the same father and mother we also share the same religion the same nature we know our Lord we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at, at an intuitive level at an innate level we know our creator we recognize him and uh, so we are supposed to make our lives unfold in line with this. So humans are supposed to be united upon the truth in that sense, just as they are united through blood. So this is the, this, this is the central theme, the overall theme, the umbrella under which everything else in Surah An-Nisa is discussed. Uh, and then the concept of family and blood relations are, are, are treated at different levels. So the highest level is the level of the family of humanity itself. Then it goes down to the level of nations, then it goes down to the levels of, uh, of the believers who follow the truth, who worship the one true God. Um, and then it goes down to the level of, as well, uh, the, the family in terms of blood relationship like a father and mother and the children which we know as the nuclear family in these days. So you can see that these levels actually um, expand across different levels of categorizing what a family actually means or conceptualizing what a family really means. So everything in the surah somehow relates and feed into the central theme. So here we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 58 and 59 talking about very important principles that will help us humans first maintain our relationships with each other and be rightful to one another uh, and then it connects that to the theme of we humans should also be dutiful to our creator so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha wa idha hakamtum بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ نِعِمَّا يَعِذُكُمْ بِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا So I'm going to, tr to read the translation from uh, the clear Qur'an. It's a very good translation of the meanings of the Qur'an. Um, yeah, indeed Allah commands you to return trusts to their rightful owners. And when you judge between people, 
judge with fairness. What a noble commandment from Allah to you. Surely Allah is all hearing, all seeing. So this is a principle. It's a main principle, very fundamental principle and a representative of other fundamental principles and ideals that are meant to govern human interaction so that the ties of this human family can be maintained and observed and respected and thus a life on this earth can be fruitful, meaningful and balanced. So Allah tells us to uh, be trustworthy, to convey the trusts back or to give the trusts back to uh, the rightful owners. And that if we judge between people, we are supposed to judge with fairness, no favoritism, no bias. And that shows that Islam in essence, or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, is all about good manners, it's all about principles. And there is no separation actually between what is truly and intrinsically human in the sense of ideals, and what Islam really is. It's actually one and the same. And whatever, sometimes we tend to claim to ourselves these ideals as if they are ours, as, as if we made them up, as if we came up with them, right? As if we humans originated justice, fairness, respect, forgiveness, love, compassion, camaraderie, and so on and so forth. As if we originated that. But we don't realize these are built in us and the one who put them in us is our creator. So we can't claim them to ourselves. We can't claim ownership over them. They are a gift in the first place from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent those ideals to us from an external source. And that's the revelation. In order just to reinforce this natural, this natural tendency within us. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Uh, in verse number, the following verse, 59, Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, <coughs> let me read the, the translation of the meaning. O believers, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. Should you disagree on anything, then refer it to Allah and His Messenger. If you truly believe in Allah and the last day, this is the best and fairest solution. So, uh, after mentioning you know, how to regulate and how to keep intact the relations between humans, Allah SWT teaches us how to keep our relationship with our source of being, with Allah Himself, intact and in balance. So these two verses actually almost cover everything about what what could be how things could go healthy in human life in terms of principles and ideals. So Allah says, "O you who believe, obey Allah and His Messenger." Obedience to Allah and His Messenger. And sometimes people like to call this blind obedience. We're in a sense, maybe if you want to look at it this way, but the reality is, as long as you truly follow Allah, your Creator, the the originator of the heavens and the earth, and His true Messenger. This is not flying. This is not blind following. You could never, you could never be more insightful than that. You could never hope for a better source than that. That's the source of truth itself. That's that's the truth itself revealing itself to you. So it's not blind following. It's actually, it, it's 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 the most. I would say, um, it's it's the it's the best thing to do in terms of insight in terms of truth in terms of information in terms of uh, seeking the right things because instead of seeking clues here and there you are actually seeking the truth right from the source and this is available to humans through revelation so this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, obey allah and obey his messenger and re the reason you do this because his messenger basically is a conveyor of the message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted him with the message. And if there is an affair that you don't find specific instructions about in the revelation, then what you can do is refer to those who are in a state of authority over you. And this authority is rightful authority, not any kind of authority. So this refers in, in religious matters, and issues of jurisprudence, what is allowed and what's not allowed, what's good and what's bad, you refer to uh, scholars or people of knowledge about 
revelation about the religion of Islam because the revelation is not only specific texts about instructions or about specific situations it also contains guidelines it also includes principles it has a complete system of how to figure things out even novel things things that you come across for the first time and this is the power of revelation here that you have guiding principles you have a a beautiful dynamic that is consistent that no matter what novel issues you're dealing with you're always going to have this consistency you will always abide by the same principles the same rules and you are holding high all these moral principles and ideals and you never violate them so you refer to the people of another knowledge of knowledge but now in terms of let's say political issues you refer to the rightful leaders of the muslim population people who understand uh, you know governance people who understand politics people who understand uh, military you know warfare etc people who have the expertise and these people are supposed to consult the scholars of the religion so it's not a matter of uh, usurping power or or uh, mon monopolizing power and and decision but it's actually a matter of risk it's a place of responsibility here and the person who's in a position of responsibility are obligated in the islamic system to seek the guidance of the people of knowledge everyone in their specific field of expertise the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, <clears throat> yeah, so Allah says this is better for you in the final, you know, estimate of things, of how things turn out to be. And this is a very beautiful system and this sets the ground for a, for a, for a profound system of governance in Islam and even a system for how we humans, individuals, can carry themselves in this life. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> he strikes an example from verse number 60 uh, to verse number 65. Allah talks about hypocrites in how or in relation to the instructions he just provided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, I'm just going to summarize the meaning. Uh, Don't you see uh, those who claim to believe in what was revealed to you and what was revealed before you? They seek the judgment of other than Allah. They seek the judgment of other than Allah. So they seek judgment of something else. Like maybe um, a man-made law, or maybe uh, the the guidance of, of of another system, and so on and so forth. When the truth and the true system from Allah, the divine system, is available to them, when they were commanded to abandon all these systems, because all of them are are made by humans, and thus they they display and they possess the faults, the deficiencies, the flaws of human beings. They are reflective. Of where they came from whereas the divine revelation is reflective of where it came from uh, and he says and shaitan wants to send them astray and if it's said to them come to Allah and his messenger so that they judge among you you will find the hypocrites turning away from you with aversion and Allah says so how when a calamity befalls them because of their own deeds then they would regret and they would come back to you apologetically. Uh, that, you know, in the past we had intended only good, right? They would fi- try to find an excuse for themselves. Allah says, Allah knows what's in their hearts. So turn away from those people. Don't put so much attention on their negativity. Don't let their negativity poison you and poison your approach to life and your handling of your affairs. But still give them advice, remind them, admonish them. Uh, in, in the way that is profound. And then Allah says, every messenger that we sent to humans, we sent them to be obeyed. And had those people who turned away from divine guidance, had they truly repented and figured out their mistakes and they wanted to uh, fix them, we would have actually accepted their apology. We would have forgiven their sins and sort of give them uh, a fresh start then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a beautiful principle in verse number 60 uh, 65 and this is one of the foundational profound verses in the Quran Allah says and actually let me read the translation here um, uh, Allah says Allah says but no by your lord they will never be true believers until they accept you o prophet 
as the judge in their disputes and find no resistance within themselves against your decision and submit wholeheartedly. So this is basically the criterion. Some of the scholars, they said, this is the criterion between belief and hypocrisy, between a true iman and, dis and, and kufr, disbelief. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates that had people done what they were commanded by their Lord, things would have turned always in their favor. But again, people are just short-sighted, people are very hasty, people are impatient, and uh, they always violate the divine principles. The divine principles are practical in essence. But if, if a person experiences impatience, they won't be able to see that because on the short term, they, they might, it might seem as though they're not working. But this is just, again, uh, the person is being impatient. This is the impatience sort of controlling people's perception. The reality is uh, ev all, all, all moral principles, all divine principles are actually pra practical. Allah tells us what the fabric of reality is, what the dynamics of this world are, so that we can align ourselves with them. But again, when we are hasty, impatient, we don't allow them to run their full course and thus we don't, we don't receive their, their fruits. And eventually Allah says, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, then these people will be among the ones Allah favored on the day, day of judgment. These are the prophets, the true believers, the martyrs and the uh, real pious uh, people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to start talking here about, from verse number 71, Allah talks about warfare. And warfare in Islam has been uh, an issue that, of, of, that brought a lot of controversy. Uh, obviously because it's been very convenient and it's been very profitable for a lot of media outlets to sort of paint Islam as a, a terrorist religion or as a religion of violence and that it incites violence, it doesn't accept other people and it seeks to force people into Islam or kill them and it seeks to take over the world and so on and so forth. And all of those, all of those are just are attempts of misreading Islam. And most, most, I would say, most of the time, most often, they're actually deliberate acts of distortion against Islam. Such a complex system as the Islamic system cannot be taken from one verse or two verses here, then trying to cite one or two incidents in history and say, okay, that's what Islam really is. It requires a very careful study because. There's a lot of nuance in history. There's a lot of nuance in any complex system. And if you want to do justice, you will need to do you will first need to approach it with as much neutrality as possible. And then you need to give the text and the system and history a fair chance. Uh, you have to give the benefit of the doubt until you exhaust all all possible all, all I would say all possible uh, positive interpretations or or fair interpretations before you arrive at such a, an unfair accusation against the Islamic uh, system. And so many things are actually, you will see, are taken out of context. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here instructs the believers to be on guard, to be, to be ready to defend themselves and to fight against the oppressors. And then Allah talks about, so this is mentioned in the context of the hypocrites. So the, there will be a lot of reference to the hypocrites. Then Allah says, some among you are actually trying to pull you down. And uh, so Allah exposes, you know, one of the signs of these, these, these people. Then Allah SWT in verse number 75 really explains what warfare in Islam is about in the first place. And this talks about aggressive war. It doesn't talk about defensive war. It talks about uh, offense in warfare. And uh, here Allah says, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرِيَةِ الظَّالِمِ أَهْلُهَا وَجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا وَجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ نَصِيرًا Verse number 75, uh, Allah says, um, And what is it with you? You do not fight in the cause of Allah for, the oppress for oppressed men, women and children who cry out, Our Lord, deliver us from this land of oppressors. Appoint, us, uh, appoint for us a savior. Appoint for us a helper, all by your grace. Then Allah says in the following verse, Believers fight in the cause of Allah, whereas disbelievers fight for the cause of the devil. So, 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here exp explains how in Islam um, that uh, what, what, what is called warfare is actually about uh, bringing about justice to people, to oppressed people. So when, when there are systems who are either overtly or covertly oppressing people, confiscating their rights, uh, abusing them, abusing their, their, their rights, uh, and these people seek help, Muslims are supposed to help not as individuals, but as legitimate, proper legitimate governments. As proper legitimate governments, they are supposed to help if they have the power and the military power and the might. And there won't be uh, worse consequences as a result of that kind of warfare. So the issue of war warfare in Islam is actually, actually the fiqh of warfare in, in Islam is one of the most complex and intricate parts of Islamic jurisprudence. It has so many details, intricate details, and has a, and the point of balance shifts with every shift in small details. So it's not for sort of any student of knowledge or even any person who just studied Islam just to say, okay, uh, to make decisions about warfare. Uh, warfare in Islam is supposed to be a matter of collective decision of the people of knowledge in terms of Islam, uh, the people of knowledge who run the government, like the, the, the government itself, the governor, the president, the leader, etc. And their advisors, their ministers, uh, their, con uh, their consultors, counselors, etc. So it's supposed to be studied thoroughly from all aspects. And when it becomes clear that uh, the, 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 the benefits for everyone, and benefits here is not a matter of pragmatism, the benefit here is in light of what is, what is moral and what is good for all people. When this is actually figured out to be the case, then they move on with it, otherwise they desist. So it's such a very careful and intricate kind of study and decision, it's not an ad hoc thing, and it's not, it's just, just throwing oneself to death or uh, acting obnoxiously and unfortunately what we have today in our uh, modern history among the Muslims all that claim to be or most of what claims to be jihad was actually is all just again against the Islamic understanding of this whole thing so this this requires a very deep understanding requires a lot of consultation requires teamwork requires collective uh, fatwa uh, that is very well informed and very, I would say, precisely decide, decided and produced. Okay, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, exposes the, the hypocrites as to how they handle the times of warfare. That they say, and I'm not, I'm just going to go over the general meanings, uh, that basically Allah says, don't you see about these people who... In the previous days, in the early days of Islam, they said it was said to them, establish the prayer and give zakah. And uh, basically, start working on yourself. Atu zakah here, it could be give zakah, and could also be purify yourself, make tizkiyah, develop yourselves in faith and in everything else. Uh, so when fighting was prescribed upon them, when the time for real warfare was prescribed upon those people, in the, in the past they were hasty, it was not time for that yet. But they were trying to push the Prophet ﷺ to get into warfare. And the Messenger ﷺ used to say to them at that time that we have not been given permission or we have not been commanded to do that. Uh, so when time now for warfare, all the conditions became perfect and the conditions for engaging in warfare were present, then these people started cowarding. They, they started to back off and uh, they started fearing people. So, and they said, Oh Allah, why do you make warfare uh, an obligation upon us or a duty upon us? We wish that you give us more time in this life. Uh, Allah says, uh, tell them that enjoyment of this life is, is short. And what is better is the hereafter or is the next life. And you will not be done any injustice, even the slightest injustice. And then Allah says, wherever you may be, death will come to you. When your time to die comes you're just going to leave regardless where you are even if you are in protected uh, towers or in in, in uh, fortified buildings um, 
All right, so the point here is that those people were impatient at the beginning because their desire to engage in warfare was not based on faith. It was not based on reason and wisdom. It was based on emotions. And that's most of what we have today. Those people who, you know, call themselves or uh, sort of uh, raise the banner, supposedly so-called jihad. Unfortunately, that's what, this is the type of thing. It's all based on emotions. It's all not, not grounded in proper Islamic fiqh and jurisprudence. And it all violates the Islamic principles. And it's all, again, based on uh, untamed emotions, uh, impatience, short-sighted understanding of things, uh, ignorance about the state of affairs and about the global state of affairs and so on and so forth. So, And you see the outcomes of their efforts have been destruction upon Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, okay, so this is generally speaking uh, how Allah addresses these people and Allah emphasizes the concept of obeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and He exposes some of the tricks of those hypocrites and how they escape or try to escape obedience to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala also talks about the hypocrites in verse number 83 as that when any of the public affairs comes to them, a matter or an important matter, they automatically start airing it and spreading it. Or maybe they could sometimes even, um, uh, you know, make form formulate an opinion or some sort of an answer or some sort of a solution and start airing it. And today we have this, this is maximized with social media. Almost everyone has access to a YouTube account or, a, uh, you know, any of the social media platforms accounts. And then these people start becoming experts, commentators, or saviors or people who think that they can offer people solution without them being really qualified, without them being people of knowledge who are able to give something of benefit. And unfortunately, that's the practice of the hypocrites, that they, these people will start airing this stuff before verifying it, before studying it well. And Allah SWT says they should have referred it to the Messenger وسلم, or to uh, those of understanding and knowledge and wisdom because those people would be able to handle it way better. Um, yeah, so that's it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the hypocrites again with regards to what happens when Muslims engage in warfare with other enemies and the hypocrites betray them. The hypocrites sort of stab the Muslims in the back. How to handle, uh, you know, how to handle this. So Allah says in um, in verse number 88 فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي أَتَيْنِ وَاللَّهُ So let me read the translation. Um, Why are you believers divided into two groups regarding the hypocrites while Allah allowed them to regress to disbelief because of their misdeeds? Do you wish to guide those left by Allah to stray? And whoever Allah leaves to stray, you will never find for them a way. You will never find for them a way. Okay, so again, these are uh, the hypocrites and how they acted in warfare. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delineates afterwards in detail uh, that they actually want you to, really they wish, they hope that you could lose your faith. That's what the hypocrites really want. From the, from the believers. Uh, Allah says, do not take them as close allies, as, as people who are close to you, as helpers and supporters. Uh, uh, until these people join you in faith. So they basically, again, this, this, this ruling has to do with Medina, when the Muslims were in Medina. And uh, the Muslims, it was an obligation upon Muslims from all around to come to Medina. Why? Because in all, almost every city where there were Muslims, they were oppressed, they were forced out of their religion. So it became an obligation upon Muslims to come and join the Prophet ﷺ. So the Muslim nation grows stronger, independent, and those people do not risk their faith while staying in their home uh, country. And this is this was so, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, after opening Mecca. 
uh, the Prophet says لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no obligation or there is no hijra migration to Medina after opening Mecca. That's it, it's over because it was mainly about the Muslims in Mecca and other cities as well but it was mainly about the Muslims in Mecca because they could not practice their religion. They could not, they were, they were actually tortured, they were forced out of their, their religion. And uh, <clears throat> some of them actually became, you know, some, some, of the, some of those who were Muslims at the beginning, they actually left Islam and some of them became hypocrites. So they were affected by that. Uh, okay, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, and, and the reason now there is a lot of mention of hypocrites is that the Muslim family, the presence of hypocrites among them, who pretend to be Muslims is extremely detrimental. So Allah sort of educates the Muslims as to how to handle these complex situations uh, without resorting again to extreme solutions which are forbidden in Islam that you kill who you think are hypocrites or you exile them or you... No, they were treated as long as they pretended to be Muslims and they were acting out outwardly as Muslims then they were treated as Muslims. And the reason is you can't dig into people's lives. You can't open up people's chests and figure out what's you know what's in their hearts. So we are supposed to deal deal with people based on what we see from them, and the reality of their heart remains with Allah. Otherwise, anyone who has a doubt about someone is going to give them trouble, or is going to report them to the to the government, and then there will be investigations. It becomes more like an inquisition, and obviously this is impractical, unfair. And it just, it doesn't even work. And it doesn't help anyone. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions some rulings as to, Allah says that no true believer would kill a believing servant. Uh, except by mistake. It might be by mistake. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, explains how if someone, if a, if a Muslim kills um, um, uh, someone by mistake how to how to actually handle this situation and uh, there are things expiations to be to be performed um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, indicates that the people who truly bring justice to the world and when they engage in war in warfare it is actually for the truth and for justice and for goodness to to the creation then those people are favored by Allah over those who uh, sit at home and do nothing. They don't engage in eliminating you know, injustice and removing oppression from the world. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates, uh, Allah talks here about uh, people who remained oppressed, Muslims who remained oppressed, and where they had to be sometimes forced out of their religion. Some of those people left, we said, some of them left Islam. Allah says these people, when they die, the angels will ask them, you know, uh, as, the, as they take their souls, you know, why didn't you leave? Isn't the, the earth so expansive that you can actually just travel and go where you could practice your religion? Uh, so those people have no excuse with Allah if they ended up leaving their, their religion because of that oppression. Because you might say, you know, if someone left their religion by, by force, then they're not obligated, right? Uh, well, the reality is, yeah, you might be forced out of your religion, but you don't give up your religion in your heart. You still be true. You be a believer inside. You might not show it, right, out of fear for your life. But the problem is, humans are very, very susceptible to their environment. So if sometimes environments are so powerful that a person, a believer, when they are oppressed or forced out of their religion, they might actually just, you know, give in. And, and and give up the religion. It's possible. And it might get them to a point of resentment where they say, if Allah, if I believe in Allah, why does Allah, you know, let me down? And then they, 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 they out of resentment, they disbelieve. Uh, or there could be many scenarios. So a person should preserve their faith. So preserving the faith is a priority for the believer. And where they live, where they don't live, what they do, what they don't do, all of these decisions should be made with this important priority, you know, at the center of that decision-making process. Except for those who were unable to leave and they were forced, then Allah would 
forgive those people. Allah in the surah, again, this is all about, again, Muslims, Muslim family, how to preserve, how to preserve iman, and so on and so forth. Uh, then Allah talks about how to pray in moments of fear. Uh, Allah explains that. And the first time the Muslims prayed the prayer of fear was when they were going for Al-Hudaybiyah, when they went for Umrah, the year um, six after Hijrah. And uh, as, as they got close to Mecca, uh, Khalid ibn al-Walid, who was a non-Muslim at the time, he was thinking of attacking them. He came with 200 soldiers and they were seeking or were trying to seize a moment to take the Muslims by surprise and attack them. So the Muslims were praying. And Allah, at that time, Allah taught, taught them how to pray at times of war so that they split into two groups and so on and so forth. Yeah, so basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still talks about the hypocrites and how to handle them in the surah. And uh, I think it's enough for today, inshallah. We're going to stop at... Uh, I didn't go into details because there's lots of details there and uh, we still wanted to stay as close as possible to the central theme and not, you know, go down into, uh, you know, many levels into the sub-themes. So we stop here by verse number 113. Uh, so we start next time, inshallah, with 1.14. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khairan for joining us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.